for all the six years that I've been here, every year have offered a sound, solid budget. And the Democrats come back with a continuing resolution. They haven't given us a budget yet. Would you get one this year? If the members would take their seats, the president will be with us in a minute. I think Bob Lagomarsino told you that we would like, we'll call on uh, two people at a time, so there will always be someone at the other microphone to ask his or her. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my high honor and great privilege to present to you the greatest president of our lifetime, President Ronald Reagan. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jack, Bob, Trent, and all of you here. First, let me begin by noting that today is the first anniversary of Claudine Schneider's 39th birthday. <laughs> No, you're not supposed to reveal anything like that, but having had, had some 37 of them myself, <laughs> I thought we should recognize it. Happy birthday. Right. Well, you and I usually meet in formal settings, but today we'll try to get beyond those barriers. There's a story that I'm sure most of you know, and I know that some, any of you my age know, and that's a World War II story about Chester Nimitz, the Admiral, and General Douglas MacArthur in a small boat and rough waves, and the boat tipped over, and, and the, as they were struggling there to save themselves, uh, Nimitz said to MacArthur, he said, I hope when we get out of this, if we do, that you won't tell my men that I can't swim. Doug said, I won't tell your men you can't swim, but you won't tell mine I can't walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I do appreciate this opportunity to be with you. I know you'll be off to New York shortly to visit the site of the first Congress of the United States, which held its opening session in March of 1789. And believe me, being here with you, I feel some of that same camaraderie that pride that Washington must have felt when he met with his officer corps, soldiers who had fought the revolution, uh, and many of whom later went on to serve in that first Congress. What would our country have been like without the leadership, the good sense, and the commitment of those individuals. 
It may be a little consolation, but I can't help but think that future generations are going to look at us in the same way, that this has been and continues to be a pivotal time for the United States. We've accomplished much in these last six years, and yet the challenges that remain are quite substantial. Those patriots of 200 years ago laid the foundation for generations of freedom, and our job is to focus on what needs to be done now to make certain that America in the next century is the prosperous and free land that we want it to be. I know how hard it is to keep the long term in mind when you're on your way to markup, answering the phone, and generally up to your elbows in alligators, but that's why we're here today, laying the foundation for the 21st century. John Adams perhaps had us in mind when he said to future generations, posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent it in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. Well, I've had days like that myself. And on the other hand, John Adams never had to face Sam Donaldson. <laughs> But those men who met in that first Congress didn't let us down, and we're not going to let down those Americans who follow us. The first step won't surprise you. It's making certain that future Americans are not stuck with paying our bills. That means sticking to the Graham Rudman Hollings commitment. And I see we've all got them on. The number for this year is 108, and the motto is no fudging. Del Latta and his Colleagues on the Budget Committee have demonstrated an impressive resolve in this regard. We shouldn't let the Democrats off the hook. They should bring a budget blueprint to the markup table so that Democrats and Republicans alike can get legitimate budget writing underway. I just had the pleasure in the other room before we came in here of telling Sam Donaldson that that's what they should do. He had a few questions about that. I don't know how he got off of Iran, but he did. <laughs> yeah. well, well, every skirmish is part of the bigger battle, and I think it's becoming clear that holding the line isn't enough. Institutional long-term solutions are needed. And to start with, could I mention here, the President's right to a meaningful veto must be restored. I'm talking about a line item veto. I think the erosion of the presidential veto has weakened the safeguards and the system with its huge continuing resolutions. That's no longer working. It ain't a pretty sight. The porkers are loose, headed for the public trough and the take-home pay of Every working person in America is in jeopardy. And with regard to that, I've often said, yes, you get buffeted about when you get between a hog and a bucket, but it has to be done. It's up to us to alert the public to the danger and to offer a way out. The greatest protection we can offer our citizens, present and future, is a line item veto for the President of the United States. Forty-three governors have it, and I don't know why they should be ahead of the President. And consistent with this, and perhaps as part of the same vehicle, we need a constitutional amendment requiring Congress to balance the budget. <laughs> if the big budget or big spenders on the Hill continue to block progress, it's time for us to take our case to the people. Last Monday, I took a big step in that direction. I wrote a letter to the minority leader of the Montana State Senate reminding him that if Montana would act on calling for a constitutional convention, this could spur the Congress to act on the balanced budget amendment. And we'll continue trying to look for ways to mobilize the public behind such an amendment. I'm told the other party has three creative ideas of that their own that they claim will bring down deficit spending. The three of them are tax, tax, and tax. You and I know it won't affect the red ink because the liberals will then spend, spend, and spend. And if that happens, the economy will go down, down, and down. 
just like it did the last time they controlled both houses of the Congress. Well, my answer to the tax hikers, and I hope I can count on you to back me up, is three. No, no, no. <laughs> We're not going to knock the legs out from under economic growth by draining resources from the private sector into the federal bureaucracy. No, we're not going to break faith with the American people who oppose high taxes and voted for us for that reason. And no, we will not thrash the historic 1986 overhaul out of, of, the, of the tax system out of being. Last year, we went on the offensive to get the special interests out of the tax code, and now it's time to get them out of the budget. We can be proud that together we turned around the American economy. Liberal economists still can't believe it. But you know, economists, they're the only ones who see something working in practice and wonder if it would work in theory. President Calvin Coolidge, although he was known as Silent Cal, he had a lot to say. He observed that we must strive for thrift, not only because it brings prosperity, but because it builds character in the people. This notion may have been scoffed at before the results of the great society came pouring in, but today it's clear that our country disregarded certain fundamental values at its peril. Today we see individuals with the great social programs of the 60s and 70s were supposed to have helped dispirited and immobilized by a total loss of self-worth and living in wretched conditions with little hope for anything else. Government policy, well-intentioned or not, has ended up depriving our most needy citizens of the strength of a family and the self-esteem of earning a living. In the months ahead, we Republicans should be in the forefront of the fight to reform from top to bottom the system that created and perpetrates this tragedy. A consensus, I think, is emerging about what should be done. And whatever the final wording, let us pledge that we'll be aggressive and that the watchwords for welfare reform will be work and family. Benjamin Franklin, who played such a role in launching our republic, once wrote, I think the best way of doing good to the poor is not making them easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. Well, it's taken a few years, but I think America is rediscovering some of the truths that Franklin was talking about. He also quoted, if you will not hear reason, she'll surely wrap your knuckles. They question my memory. I remember the day when old Ben told me that. <laughs> Our forefathers, those who occupied that hall in New York that you will visit, were as brave as they were innovative and far-sighted, and we can afford to be no less. We've already come a long way in these last six years. Together we've rebuilt our military power, which was permitted to seriously erode during the last decade. We've strengthened our alliances, and together we've launched a research program that could well usher our country and all of mankind into a safer time, an era when peace would depend on technology of defense and protection rather than weapons with which we threaten retaliation and mass destruction. We've mobilized some of this country's brightest minds for our strategic defense initiative, and I'm gratified at the progress that's been made. Now, there are those who oppose on principle any steps the United States might take that could have strategic implications. They may believe it's safer to stand still, but they're wrong, dead wrong. Sir Francis Bacon wrote long ago, he that will not apply new remedies must expect new evils, for time is the greatest innovator. Today we have no insurance against the accidental launch of a nuclear-armed missile or the possibility that such a missile could be obtained and launched by a fanatic or an unstable third world dictator. It's a bit difficult to understand those who would ignore this potential danger. If they think that by being nice guys the threat will go away, they don't need to take a cruise to Fantasy Island. They've already arrived. We believe that SDI, even if not 100 percent effective, will offer a very high degree of protection. The more protection, the better. The question we must ask is, what's wrong with a system that saves lives, a system of deterrence based increasingly on defense, 
which threatens no one rather than offense. Furthermore, SDI is a major stimulus to nuclear arms reduction. The less effective a ballistic missile, the more negotiable it becomes. With SDI on the scene, cheating becomes less likely or threatening, making arms reduction agreements more likely. In short, SDI is totally consistent with the goals, the values, and the inspirations of the American people and our fellow democracies. We aren't going to see it grounded by a lack of courage to face the future or a lack of vision in smoke-filled rooms someplace here in Washington. While we're on the subject of arms reduction, let me just thank all of you for hanging tough these last few years. In Reykjavik, we made a step forward, and then just a few weeks ago, I believe a turning point was reached. The Soviets may have finally gotten the message. Their removal of a major obstacle, which has prevented deep reductions of U.S. and Soviet intermediate-range missiles following the principle of the zero-option formula that we proposed six years ago, could well open the way to an historic agreement. I understand the caution on the part of many toward agreements with the Soviet Union. But let me assure you, as in all our dealings with them, realism has been and remains our guiding principle. I am not a linguist, but I used a few words of Russian on the General Secretary in our last meeting. And uh, he did smile. He changed the subject. But I said, Dobrei, no probrei. Trust, but verify. Now, trying to prove our sincerity. <laughs> trying to prove our sincerity by making unilateral concessions or accepting unequal agreements, which seems to be the strategy of some members of our domestic opposition, is not the path to a safer world. If we can achieve an actual reduction in the number of nuclear weapons with our steadfast approach, History will record who the real champions of a more peaceful world really were, and it won't be the accommodationists. The bottom line remains that peace through strength is not a slogan. It's the only way to achieve a lasting peace. Finally, I'd like to thank each of you, especially your leader, Bob Michael, for standing firm for freedom in Central America during one of the more frustrative times of this or any administration. In the last four months, we've endured an unrelenting barrage. And after months of a steady drumbeat by the opposition, a change of 18 votes in the House would have won the day for our stand against an ill-conceived moratorium plan that would pull the plug on those brave freedom fighters. And I call that kind of a moral victory. What we're facing is a strategic move by the Soviet Union. They're not pouring over a billion dollars of military aid into Nicaragua to secure their supply of fresh bananas. Uh, liberals, liberals on the Hill here may be able to keep the United States out of Central America, our own front yard, but their moaning and groaning certainly isn't going to keep the Soviets out. If the Communists ever got a hold of some of those fellows, they'd do more than straighten their tie. Uh, <laughs> The Kremlin will continue its adventurism, and the Sandinistas will continue to communize Nicaragua and apply pressure on its neighbors unless we make it clear that the cost will be too high. We can do that today without spilling the blood of our young servicemen just by helping the freedom fighters. The price of peace in this hemisphere and a secure southern border will be higher and much more heartrending if we falter in the months ahead. As the current controversy fades, and it will, we must make certain the American people understand what the stakes are in Central America and see that the basic issues haven't changed since last year. We'll get those 18 votes. We'll win more than a moral victory and give democracy and the next generation of Americans a chance. We don't want to pass this problem on. Communists have a way of twisting words. They call their governments people's democracies. You know the difference between a democracy and a people's democracy? It's the same difference between a jacket and a straitjacket. <laughs> yeah. 
on helping the freedom fighters, you've made all the difference. The fight you made in the House made possible our Senate victory. But I couldn't conclude here without men mentioning that I'll need your help again on an issue I noted at the start of this talk, protecting the family budget, not the federal budget. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post all have found something very wrong with the current highway bill. And I say that if those three newspapers can agree, so can we. In fact, I just happen to remember a letter that Bob Dornan wrote me a while back, signed by 150 of you, in which you pledged to help me when I veto spending bills. Well, today, I'm going to take you up on it. Now, those of you who care about 65 miles an hour, believe me, so do I. So first, help me sustain this veto, and then let's clean up this bill and get it back to me in a week, and I'll sign it within hours. I'm not totally against that. I'm just against that version of it. And uh, I think there's a better version that we can find, and it won't break the bank. Now, let's take a quick look at the agenda, but as Newt Gingrich is already always reminding me, we're a party of ideas. So I'd welcome your thoughts on all of this. And uh, Jack, I understand that that's the end of the monologue and we're going to have a dialogue now. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll do our we'll uh, do our best to get as many questions in as possible. Uh, may I have uh, the pleasure of uh, just for the moment before the president uh, answers questions of introducing a longtime friend of ours, a real champion of the Reagan agenda, is uh, Chief of Staff Senator Howard Baker. <laughs> Uh, first question, Tom DeLay. Second question, Steve Gunderson, then Joe Diaguardi. Yes. Mr. Mike? President, oh. Yeah. Oh. I'm Tom DeLay from Texas. Uh, I support your veto, even though I have a project in that bill. Um, and uh, we'll work to, to help you sustain that veto. But I'd also like for you, to, in your veto message, to think about the things that we could not do in that highway bill that would have saved money like uh, Davis-Bacon and Section 13C and your staff could inform you about that. But I'm actually here to talk about what I think is your upcoming trip to the nation and talking about excellence. And uh, I'm here to talk about competitiveness, not trade, although that's a part of it, but competitiveness given back to America. Uh, one of the problems that we have with competitiveness in America today is is gov the government policies of the last 20 or 30 years. And I would hope, Mr. President, when you go out and talk about competitiveness, we grab back the political uh, rhetoric that UAW is doing in, in their ads on television, uh, uh, the protectionists are trying to do, and the Democrats have grabbed away from us. We're losing that battle. We need to tell the American people because of spending, tax policy, environmental policy, regulatory policy, safety policy, uh, we are lowering their standard of living, and uh, we are lowering their opportunities to have jobs. And I would hope, Mr. President, that you would talk to them in that vein and grab back the issue. Well, I have, and, and uh, I will in the future very much. In our meetings at the Economic Summit, I think you'd be all be interested to know that uh, the first time after we began to show the recovery and our economic plan was in place here, I walked in and it was an unusual greeting that I got from those. I was, up to then, I was the new kid in school. And uh, all of a sudden, they just in unison asked me to explain the American miracle to them. And uh, I did my best to explain it. But you're right. Uh, I think that, that they 
uh, competitiveness is going to also be part of them following in what we've done, and yet, even though that may make them better in their economies, it'll be better for us because they will be better able to afford the things that we make and so forth. Their standards will go up and approach ours, and we're going we're gonna to continue trying to do that. Thank you. Steve Gunderson. Mr. President, Congressman Steve Gunderson from Wisconsin, uh, many of us in here represent rural parts of this country, and through the help of yourself, our leadership, and the campaign committee, we can tell you, unlike the Senate, that not one rural Republican who ran for re-election in 86 was defeated. But I'm here today on behalf of many of us, I think, who are asking for your help as we look to the future to understand there is a transition going on in rural America. And when we talk about competition, competitiveness, and we recognize that transition, very frankly, we are asking for the leadership of you as the President in the White House in providing some real initiatives in terms of economic development in rural America. Most of our initiatives that Tom Coleman, Ed Madigan, and Bob Smith and others have developed actually don't even cost money. It's just changing formulas to get rural America a fair shake, and uh, I'm here to ask for your help in that regard. I think all of us need each other's help in this, in coming up with a program that will get agriculture back out there in the marketplace instead of where it has been for so many years. The, and I've asked for a complete study of how we can do this, not with, by pulling the rug out from under, but uh, agriculture for so long has now been a, well, they're farming government more than they're farming the land. But we have now a worldwide situation of the world producing more in agriculture than the world can consume. And yet we've got a program that has encouraged increasingly that very overproduction. But one of the greatest, I could go on here about the fallacies in our present program, but when I tell you that the overwhelming majority of the money, $26 billion last year, went to farmers who had an average income of around $200,000 a year and assets of about $900,000. Now that's not exactly a program that is to help the family farm <laughs> uh, out of uh, some temporary hard times. But we do need to review this entire program and that's what we're doing to try and come up with a proposal that will rely on the marketplace. And then at the same time, if there are people that um, are going to have to turn in other directions, we should stand by ready to help them with training and everything that would be needed to set them on a different course. I have 19 names on my list. I'm not trying to turn anybody off, but for the convenience of our colleagues, please make your question as brief as possible so that we can get as many questions in. Joe Diaguardi, Pat Swindoll. Right. Thank Joe Diaguardi, New York. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we all realize that there's a serious lack of financial accountability here in Washington. The public is not getting a good count. You mentioned fudging, you mentioned the budget process. Today, we are still using the Mickey Mouse cash basis accounting system and budget system that we took New York City off of in 1975 as a price for the bailout. Today, 37 states employ a capital budget, yet the United States of America, the world's largest financial enterprise, does not. Uh, last September, you and your chief of staff then said that high on your priority list in the agenda would be budget reform and a capital budget. Have you changed that view? No, we are trying for a budget reform because I think you all would have to agree with me. The budgeting process here at the national level compared to that of most of the states in the union is just Mickey Mouse. And I don't think a state would put up with it. Now, we have a capital budget in California when I was governor, but I do have to tell you one phase of it. That that is that um, for any of the bond issues, on that capital side, uh, the people had to vote on them. And the, the people determined whether they wanted what was being offered enough to vote on it. And uh, actually it took more than a 50% plus one vote to achieve that bond issue. But that has to be looked at. And uh, we have a system right now in which by uh, bookkeeping tricks with some of the trust funds that can't be used for anything else but a specific purpose, the deficit is really worse than it appears. And it's time we quit kidding ourselves and the people and got right down to what are we spending and what are we taking in. That does uh, uh, The various measures 
that are over budget. One example, many examples come to mind, but one in specific uh, was the $500 million uh, homeless bill that this Congress passed as one of its first acts. Uh, certainly that should have been vetoed in my judgment, and so my question to you is, may we have that uh, commitment, and secondly, why have we not had that consistency in the past? Well, I'm going to try to do that. I know that there are sometimes uh, uh, bills that you, uh, you wobble about on as to whether you sign them or not, but I also, I also have to say that I have been prevented from vetoing a lot of things that would have been vetoed because of the practice of the continuing resolution, where the only thing you can do is shut the government down and veto the whole thing. And again, I say, give me a crack at vetoing the things in there that should be vetoed, the line item veto. If you don't like the veto, you can override it. And uh, I can only tell you that as a governor in eight years, I line itemed 943 items and was never overridden once. Thank you. Uh, Fred Grandy, Frank Wolf. Fred Grandy of Iowa. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Right. I wanted to know if you could give the conference some idea of what your administration expects to see from the Contra movement in Central America between now, when they receive the 40 million, and next fall, when the administration will probably ask this Congress for more money. Is there a, a blueprint for progress that you see, and does it involve perhaps uh, the Arias proposal Costa Rica is initiating? Well, we've been greatly encouraged by just what has been taking place, although you don't see much about that. There's a, quite a disinformation network by the Sandinista government. And it does manage to get its story and its side in much of the American media. You don't see the victories on the other side. But the Contras who, there was a time when they re really were just kind of scattered, hit and running. But they now apparently have a plan that is based on true guerrilla tactics, but aimed at specific targets and targets of st strategic and economic importance to the Sandinistas. And they have been quite successful recently. As I say, you don't hear about them, but knocking out power combines, bridges, and things of this kind, which they hadn't been doing before. You've got to remember that in the military, a, a guerrilla fight, guerrilla fighters, you have to have at least a 10 to 1 superiority in numbers in the regular military to, to successfully uh, curb them. So the number uh, we shouldn't overlook that fact. We've got about 12,000 of them already across the border in there, but they are uh, better trained and now have a better strategic program, and I expect to see that uh, continuing and rolling on. And it's the only pressure, I believe, that along with the rest of us and their neighbors is going to have any chance of bringing anything of a nonviolent uh, solution. Frank Wolf of, uh, Frank Wolf uh, Mr. President, the country of Romania has been persecuting the evangelical church. They've been turning Bibles into toilet paper. They've been persecuting the Catholic church. I would ask two questions. One, would you direct the State Department to come out and oppose most favored nation status for the barbaric country of Romania? Their secret police are more repressive than a KGB. The second question is this. There's a law in the books now that prohibits the importation of goods made by slave labor in the Soviet Union into the United States. Sharansky has identified many products that are made by slave labor in the Russia that come into the United States. Would you urge your Treasury Department to enforce the law to prohibit the importation of goods like chess sets and wood carvings that come in from the Soviet Union that are made by slave labor? Yes, and we, we have been talking about that and will continue to talk about it. And on the other one, Romania, we have a ticklish problem there. Many of the things you say about Sosescu, the, the uh, dictator there, are absolutely true. On the other hand, the thing that we've uh, sort of wanted to encourage a little bit is the fact that uh, he is the only head of one of the satellite states there that uh, is going his own way and uh, kind of thumbing his nose at the Soviet Union and getting away with it. And, uh, 
we'd like to hope that maybe we could, could persuade him to improve his domestic policies at the same time that he continues showing that example to the other satellite states of being able to stand up to the Soviets, which he is doing. Thank you. Marge uh, Rakama, uh, Larry Craig. Marge is from New Jersey, Larry's from Idaho. Uh, Mr. President, I want to congratulate you for your statement on the welfare reform, and I hope you pursue that vigorously. I know you will. Uh, I don't exactly have a question, but I have little opportunity to get messages to you. So I want to, I want to uh, get a message to you, which I have repeated before, both to you and, the, and uh, the New York Times, and that is on the subject of Medicare reform. I appreciate what you've done in supporting Dr. Bowen's proposal, but I must suggest that based on the temper of, the, of my district as I see it, this subject of Medicare and the cost of long-term care, which is really part two, is a growing political issue, and I would hope that under your leadership that the Republican Party can get ahead of that issue before the 1988 campaign. I think it will become an issue that will dwarf the flap over Social Security colas and will be a live political tinderbox of an issue in 88. If you have any comments. Yes, Marge, uh, let me tell you that we are, we were faced with a dilemma and we argued both ways about what we were going to do with this, this plan of catastrophic illness and so forth. And some wanted to wait until we could have a complete plan and then move. We thought that at least to get that chunk of catastrophic protection for all of our over 65 people was worth moving, but at the same time, we are continuing to study and, and to work with the private insurance companies to find out how we can meet these other problems. And you know, Joe Sixpack out there and his family, he's got a, a threat of catastrophic illness or injury too. And uh, we want to find a way to help them. But uh, we, we are working to see what we can do on the whole package. Thank you very much. Larry Craig of Idaho. Mr. President, Larry Craig of Idaho, let me thank you very much for your letter to the legislators in Montana last week. It was well received and greatly appreciated. Bob Smith of Oregon and I, Charlie Stenholms of Texas, and Tom Carper will this week introduce a bipartisan balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Last year we had 230 co-sponsors. We think we will have as many or more this year. It is critical for you to continue your open and public support of this issue as we fight the Graham-Rudman battle and the budget battle, because we think it will lend credibility as the other side attempts to destroy the process. And we really appreciate your effort. Thank you very much, believe me. And then we will lean on the Senate. We've come close once before. And uh, my, my letter to Montana was the hope that it would help uh, raise the temperature with regard to that whole measure here, because I would certainly prefer us doing it here than Absolutely. the Constitutional Convention route uh, called to the states. Thank you. Manuel Lujan and uh, Dan Coates. Oh. Okay, Dan Coates. Thank you. Al McCandless, Dan Coates. Mr. President, Dan Coates from Indiana. I am a strong supporter of Contra aid, and I think we uh, face a grave danger of renewing that aid by vote in the House and the Senate for next year's funding if some things aren't done in the next few months. I would just suggest we look at two things. One, a pr some, from a public relations standpoint, if nothing else, proposal of conditions under which the United States would negotiate with a dead, firm deadline set for the Sandinistas either to comply or not comply before the vote so that we can go home and say, we tried that, we've set these conditions, they rejected them. Secondly, somehow utilizing the very effective talents of President Duarte to come up here and explain again what he's doing in his country, what the threat is to his country. We have a success there, a democratization of that country he is very effective, and perhaps you can work with him in bringing him here, explaining the story, so that we have something to talk about in that next vote. Well, that's a, that's a very good idea and a thing to think about. But again, this thing that I said about the inability to get our story across. Some time ago, there were three uh, people from Nicaragua up here. One of them was an evangelist, uh, a black preacher, uh, who called attention to the fact that he doesn't have any ears anymore. They were cut off 
while he was in jail in Nicaragua. He was only arrested for preaching, that's all. He hadn't done anything else. The other two had been former members of the Sandinista government and couldn't stand it and walked away. Over at the State Department, they brought a cache of, of weapons that they had uncovered and so forth to show what was going on down there. And they all spoke and told of their experiences and this minister speaking, telling of his. And I was there and afterward to say a few words of thanks to them. The entire audience was the Washington Press Corps. And then that night, I turned on the news waiting to see. Well, they showed me saying a few words of thanks and so forth to three fellows sitting on the stand. The people never got to hear one word of what those three men had to tell. So if you weren't in the room, nobody else in the country knew the horrible stories they had to tell. We've got to do better about that. I called a Catholic bishop who came back to Iowa. He was hailed in the press as having led some refugees out of Nicaragua across the Honduran border, but before they got to the border, they were attacked by the Contras. I called him when he got back to Iowa, told him who, who I was and <laughs> what I wanted to know and said I'd read this story. Well, he said, that's entirely wrong. He said, yes, I was leading them out. We were attacked by the Sandinistas and the Contras rescued us. But that story has never appeared publicly. Al McCandless. Helen Bentley. Mr. President, uh, I'd like to talk to you about the highway bill. In my four plus years here, I think I voted for one appropriation bill and continuing resolution in keeping with the California spirit, <laughs> if you will. This bill is uh, $86.3 billion, of which $2.1 billion comes from general revenue. The balance comes from the Highway Trust Fund, which is a user's fund. The problem that has been explained to me, and there seems to be a difference of opinion on this between those in the transportation field and those in the Department of Transportation, that the Highway Trust Fund would be drawn down too rapidly, and that if the project of five years, uh, the bill of five years would continue to be funded, that they would be back for general revenue funding because the trust fund would be exhausted. I have a vested interest in this because in my part of California we have over 300 miles of interstate highways and I will confess to you that I have one project, pilot project, due to the fact that we had 12, 1,200 accidents and 60 plus deaths on this one highway in, in three years according to Caltrans. But the important part here is I would ask you to revisit this based upon the fact that it, it is highway trust fund money, a user fee. We want to revisit it, and as I say, we want a better bill than this one, but and let me just tell you that some of you have got particular problems in your own uh, district about this bill. Uh, I shouldn't be talking my hometown of Los Angeles. One of the things I've got against the certain features of the bill that don't belong in there, I think, a lot of them to do with transit. Los Angeles would get 14 percent of the total amount of the money for its proposed subway. And I don't think Los Angeles needs the Norman people of Vermont and New Hampshire and so forth to help get their workers on time. Mr. President, we have become a debtor nation. The, we have the biggest debt of all the industrialized countries today. And of course that's because of our deficit spending. Why don't we, or have we, at any point insisted that the NATO countries and the Far Eastern countries pay for the cost of our troops overseas because this is a big part of over a hundred billion dollars of our yes. spending. Well, I think one of our problems with, say, the NATO allies and some of these other places is that they just, uh, they would be lost without us. That, and at the same time, we have to recognize in return that what would be the situation of the United States if Europe fell? if we didn't have a NATO and Europe was overrun. Uh, the other thing is that we get an advantage when we whittle back on the foreign aid, military aid, that, that kind of aid to other countries. Uh, we, it's very costly to us. For example, a country like Turkey, it only costs a few thousand dollars a year for them to provide a military man and provide the security there in their area that otherwise we would feel maybe in our strategic plan we would have to provide. It would be 10 times as much for us to have to provide military there. So the more that we can encourage 
them to do this by us providing some financial aid to help them do it, the more money we save by not being forced to position American troops in all those places. Breaking us. Doug B. Ryder. Doug B. Ryder, Nebraska. Mr. President, some of us are concerned that the administration, perhaps yourself, uh, have proposed to go to zero for intermediate range nuclear missiles in Western Europe and that the commitment of the Western European nations for conventional forces to meet the Soviet threat has not been demonstrated, perhaps could not be uh, demonstrated. Uh, and this may decouple uh, the United States from Western European defense. It uh, could hurt Western European chances of uh, survival and uh, hurt the uh, United States as well. What can you say to us that might reassure us that, in fact, we do not intend to go down to zero for this kind of uh, nuclear missile? Well, ultimately, I would hope that we would go down to zero for all kinds of nuclear weapons. I think there is something immoral in the whole world, a world that a few, only a few years ago had all kinds of combat rules about protecting civilians and the innocent and not making war on the non-combatants. And now we suddenly turn to the place where we place our security as dependent on a weapon whose principal target would be the non-combatants and the wiping out of cities and the, and the population. And I would like to see it done away with ultimately, but not in the sense of, as I say, doing, as I said in my remarks, doing anything unilaterally. And I would like to point out that, yes, the European countries and the balance between us and the Soviet Union, all of us, conventional weapons is very much on the other way. But I don't like ever talking in advance about negotiating principles. But I know enough to know that Mr. Gorbachev has a very real and great economic problem. And that economic problem has been magnified by their continued buildup. And I don't have in mind eliminating all of those weapons in Europe and then leaving them with that conventional superiority. And I know it would be very costly for us to overcome them, but it's also very costly for them. And they know that the combined European countries and the United States, if we were forced to it, can do it to a far better extent than they can. So what is at stake here is if we can go forward with the reducing of those weapons at the same time that we say to them, to the Soviet Union, you can have your choice. You can join us in reducing down to equality in conventional weapons, or you can engage us in an arms race you can't win. Now make your choice. And I think with their economic situation, this is what I think is a bargaining point on our side. But no, we would never let them remain with that great advantage. Bob Thank Dornan, you. Jay Rhodes, Newt Gingrich, Mr. President, we painted this room for you six years ago, and I'm glad to see you here. Your ultra-experienced, excellent chief of staff said that we should do this once a month. And, I, <laughs> and I, I think we should. Mr. President, I have in my hand the letter which you addressed in the body of your remarks. I'm not going to release it to the press. Suffice it to say, every one of our leaders up there but one is on this letter making you veto proof. You call it the shotgun behind the door. I took a head count. Two of the people on this letter are already in heaven, Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Gratberg, and 18 others have gone back to the private sector. They're all doing very well. That leaves you a shortfall, because we had three over the third we needed, shortfall of 17. There are 23 freshmen. It's up to you, sir, to work those 23 freshmen. Now, you mentioned Los Angeles. Orange County has everything in the bill that we asked for including a million dollar project around Anaheim Stadium for my district. This is going to hurt me. I'm getting very good press right now. We had a two hour discussion with my staff last night. Mr. President, I will, and it hurts a lot, support your veto, and I hope there are more to come. Let's put a task force together to pair the transportation bill back to what you think is acceptable under a responsible budget. God bless you, well, I'm with you. I'll take God the bless heat. you and thank you. Mr. President, I'm Jay Rhodes from Arizona. I want to thank you for being here with us this morning. This has been fascinating. Mr. President, I know that you know 
how vitally important it is to the United States that we have a, a strong and economically sound state of Mexico. Unfortunately, Mr. President, outside of, of our border states, it's very difficult for us to get that message across. I think it's extremely important that the people in this room and the people of this country begin to understand just exactly what's at stake for us in Mexico. And I would plead with you to, to help lead us in that direction. I'm asking you, please, help us tell the story about Mexico. Believe me, uh, from the very first day I was ever here, or even when I was just a president-elect, uh, I established a relationship with the then president, and now with this new one, we're on a first-name basis. And uh, I have believed that that border, as well as the Canadian border, uh, these should become meeting places, not lines of division between us. And if we, and then, as you know, first year I was here, I made a trip to Latin America. Uh, I just have to believe that in the past, we fumbled the ball. Too many times we've gone with the best of intentions with some